In distance running, names like Nermi, Zatapec, Kutz, and Bikola once dominated the racing scene, and for many years, Americans were far down the pack of finishers. For years, Americans were unsophisticated in the conditioning tactics required to be competitive internationally. In the late 50s, American runners began to get an exposure to international competition and to training methods used by foreign runners. Applying these concepts, American runners began to edge into the international racing scene. Today, American distance runners have vaulted to the top of international competition. Part of the reason for this surge is innovative and progressive distance programs like the one at the University of Oregon, led by head coach Bill Dellinger. The University of Oregon has had a strong running program throughout the 20th century. It started with Bill Hayward, gained international exposure through Bill Bowerman, and continues today. The program has produced a tremendous number of outstanding distance runners. The reason I feel the program has been so strong is not only the great heritage in track, but an environment in Oregon that's conducive to running. Also, a training program based on principles of common sense that have been refined through the years. An understanding of the conditioning program at the University of Oregon must be prefaced by a discussion of the principles of training followed by all Oregon runners since the Bill Hayward era. Every aspect of conditioning takes into account these guiding principles. The first principle in our running program is what we call the principle of moderation. Simply put, it means that a runner is better off to be undertrained than overtrained. As Arthur Lydier once said, train, don't strain. If pure mileage were the answer to being a better runner, then the runner with the most time would become the best runner. Fortunately for us, it's not quite that simple. Rather than an athlete boosting the number of miles run every couple of weeks, the principle of moderation means the athlete may run 60 or 70 miles per week for several months or even a year before increasing his mileage. The most important thing for a young distance runner to learn is patience. Let the body develop and do not overtrain, and the results will come eventually. Training with moderation will help to keep the athlete healthy and free of injury. It will also help him to keep a positive mental approach to distance running. The second principle we use in our running program at Oregon is what we call principle of progression. It involves setting individual goals for our runners and then setting up a program to meet those goals. At Oregon we use what we call date and goal pace progression and it involves periodically testing the runners to see if the proper progression is being maintained. Date pace and goal pace progression are used by all distance runners in the Oregon system. Goal pace sets a target time the athlete is capable of reaching several months down the road. Date pace is what he is capable of running when beginning training. Early in the season, the athlete is tested to determine his beginning date pace. In September, for example, the athlete comfortably runs a mile in five minutes, or approximately 75 seconds per quarter mile. The coach and athlete determine that he would like to be running a 404 mile, or approximately 61 seconds per lap. The date pace is 75 seconds per quarter. The goal pace becomes 61 seconds per quarter. The athlete and coach must begin a training program designed to meet the goal pace. A graph is constructed showing a progression necessary to achieve goal pace. For example, in January, the athlete must run the equivalent of four 68-second laps to achieve his goal. In early May, he must be able to run 64-second pace to achieve the 61-second pace in June. To reach these preset goals, the athlete must perform workouts designed to progress him toward his goal. For example, although the athlete will not be able to run a 404 mile in October, he can run breakdowns which equal a mile at goal pace with adequate rest between each. In this way, effective distance training blends running at goal pace with the athlete's date pace. Initially, goal pace intervals should be of short duration with the bulk of the training at date pace. As conditioning improves, goal pace intervals increase. The recovery between reps decreases until ultimately the entire workout is performed at goal pace. Date pace and goal pace, an important concept to understand in progressing as a distance runner. The third principle in our running program at Oregon is what we call principle of variation. 
Nothing is more boring than to have to do the same workout on a particular day, week after week. At Oregon, the running patterns will change frequently to present a challenge and also to keep the program interesting. In meeting the principle of variation, the running program at the U of O incorporates a variety of patterns such as interval training, variations in repetitions, and individualized fartlek training. In addition to varying individual workouts, the environment can be varied by training in the mountains, on the beach, or by training in a different part of the country. By varying the workout and the environment, the tedium of training can be reduced, and a positive mental attitude can be maintained. The fourth principle in our running program at Oregon is what we call the principle of adaptability. This is where the art of coaching is involved in the training program. It means common sense on the part of the coach and runner alike. It is the ability to adapt the program to the weather conditions, the facilities at hand, and the health of the runner. An adaptable training program may include swimming, bicycle riding, and running in waist-deep water for injured athletes. Additionally, running stadium steps, running in the early morning, midday, or late evening may be necessary for athletes on tight time schedules. To be competitive, the athlete must adapt his training to fit any circumstances and be willing to bend a little according to the situation. The last concept we have in our running program at Oregon is what we call the callousing principle. It involves preparing our athletes to meet varying situations that might occur in competition. When a good runner wins a tough race over top competition, it is not necessarily because he is just faster than everyone else. In most world-class competition, it is because the athlete has prepared himself for the challenge. He has calloused himself to the training required to be competitive. He has calloused himself to the conditions, training at high altitude, in high humidity, in a pouring rain if necessary, to prepare himself for the race. He has disciplined himself to the pace he will run, altering his pace only as designed, not on a whim in the middle of the race. He has prepared himself for his closing kick, his final surge, or for other race tactics that will lead him to victory. Callousing means preparing, and at Oregon, 90% of competing is preparing. Moderation, progression, variation, adaptability, and callousing are the five principles of the running program at Oregon. Every phase of our training and conditioning program embraces at least one or more of these principles. The conditioning program for distance runners is subdivided into three elements, strength development, flexibility development, and running conditioning. Strength development plays an important role in the overall development of any athlete, including distance runners. It is a fairly new concept in distance running, but has been very useful in our program to prepare the runners strength-wise and mentally towards competition. In our routines at Oregon, we will lift weights during the off-season three times a week and during the season twice a week. Weight training for distance runners is divided between exercises on Nautilus machines which stress individual muscle groups and specialized lifts with free weights. Nautilus drills recommended for distance runners follow. Back extensions are done on a bench with the knees locked under a bar to support the body. The athlete bends at the waist and raises to a fully extended position. Inclined sit-ups are done on an inclined bench with knees bent and the ankles held by another athlete or a padded ankle support. Hip and back flexors are performed with a weight behind each knee. The athlete raises one knee to the vertical and powers down with the leg, extending through the range of motion. Decline sit-ups are performed with the knees bent and ankles hooked under a bracing bar. The athlete extends to a fully reclining position, hands on the shoulders, twists his trunk completely one direction, then the other, before completing the sit-up. Keep toes pointed ahead throughout this drill. Leg curls are performed lying on the stomach with the legs under the weight bar. Both single and double leg curls are recommended. The abductor-adductor machine provides strength work for the muscles of the inner and outer leg and groin area. These drills may be duplicated with an assisting coach or fellow athlete. Calf raises strengthen the calf muscles, very important for leg extension and leg drive. 
Perform calf raises with the feet in three positions, straight ahead, with the toes pointed in, and with the toes pointed out. Strength work for the upper chest and back is provided by performing pullovers. Pullovers can be performed in the Nautilus machine designed for this exercise or by lying on a bench and using a barbell. Form running exaggerates the movement of the running motion. With a weight in each hand, power the arms through the full range of motion of running. Hanging hip flexors are designed to improve knee pickup through strengthening the muscles of the upper thigh and lower back. Front lateral raises is a specialty drill designed to get full extension of the abdominal muscles and those of the chest. Bring the weights together in front of the body, arms extended. While breathing in, raise the weights over the head and raise to the toes for full extension. Expel the breath and separate the weights to be lowered alongside the body for a full repetition. Diaphragm exercises are done exclusively for strengthening the diaphragm muscle. Inhale deeply holding a heavy barbell loosely in the hands. The diaphragm or breathing muscle alone will raise the chest cavity at the same time raising the barbell. Strengthening the diaphragm will expand the capacity of the lungs and increase the ability to forcefully expel breath while running. Weightlifting for distance runners is designed to establish a foundation of strength and to maintain strength throughout the season. Weightlifting for endurance with many repetitions of less than maximum resistance is recommended. Flexibility is vital to the conditioning of distance runners. Stretching and flexibility routines are necessary to stretch the muscle tissue, to increase the flexibility of movement of the limbs around a joint, and to loosen the muscle tissue itself to avoid possible damage from a snapped muscle or a muscle pull. Flexibility stretching also lessens the likelihood of ligament or tendon damage. Distance runners are particularly susceptible to muscle, tendon, and ligament strain, as well as muscle cramps. Our runners at Oregon all perform 15 to 20 minutes of stretching and flexibility exercises before and after running. If these are performed on a regular basis, it will help prevent many injuries that might occur in your running program. After a short jog or warm-up, distance runners might do the following stretching drills. The first drill shown stretches the gluteal muscles of the rump and the hamstrings. Pull one knee to the chest, crossing the foot over the still extended leg. While grasping the leg to the chest, attempt to stretch the hip down to touch the ground. As in all stretching drills, achieve a position of maximum flexibility and hold the position. Do not bounce or rock the body, as doing so may tear or strain a muscle. The next drill stretches the hamstrings and the quadriceps. Lying flat on the back, Stretch one leg to the chest, at the same time holding the still extended leg flat. Alternate legs, holding the stretch position for a minimum of 30 seconds. A drill excellent for stretching the muscles of the groin, the hamstrings, and the lower back is performed with the legs extended to the sides. Lean forward, grasping a stationary object, and pull the trunk as low as possible. A variation of this drill can be done by keeping the legs together and flat on the ground. Stretch forward over the legs, keeping toes pointed forward, and grasp the ankles, attempting to touch the ground with the elbows. A drill very effective for stretching the hamstrings and gluteal muscles is performed by standing on a stair and holding on to the underside of the stair. Stretch upward with the legs fully extended if possible. Work into this position gradually. Do not attempt to achieve the fully extended position immediately. Each stretching drill should be performed for a set period then relax before doing another set. A split stretch designed to stretch the abductor and adductor muscles of the upper leg, as well as the hamstrings and calf muscles, is performed with the front foot straight ahead and the back foot cocked at an angle. Face forward, as in the running position, and stretch over the lead leg. A variation of this drill is performed by changing the position of the back foot. Additional stretching force is placed on the hamstrings and quadriceps in this position. The bridge or crab stretch provides stretching of the quads, abdominal muscles, chest muscles, and shoulders and arms. The hurdle stretch is excellent for all runners, stretching the hamstrings, the quadriceps, and the calf muscles. One version of the hurdle stretch starts with the lead leg bent back toward the body. The athlete turns his upper body away from the trail leg, further stretching the gluteal muscles. The athlete can then extend the lead leg stretching the upper body over the lead leg and over the trail leg. Two drills effective for stretching the calf muscles are recommended. 
One, performed in the pike position, is done with one leg crossed over the other, attempting to put the heel of the leading leg flat on the ground. In the other method, lean against a wall or pole and extend the heel of the back leg to the ground. One additional drill effective for stretching the muscles of the hip and upper leg is performed holding on to a stationary object and bowing the hip toward the wall or pole. The foot of the leg being stretched is slightly ahead of the opposite foot. The most significant part of any training program for distance running is the actual running. In Oregon, we start in the fall and we peak for the collegiate track season in June. All five of our training principles are involved in this preparation. Running preparation is broken down into three basic elements, interval training, repetition training, and fartlek training. All distance races from 800 meters through 10,000 meters embrace these elements. Lydiard Fartlick, named after the famed New Zealand running coach Arthur Lydiard, is even-paced aerobic running designed to acquire strength and to develop cardiovascular endurance. This type of fartlek running can be performed for a set period or a predetermined distance, running at an even pace. The second type of fartlek we do in our running program at Oregon is what we call Homer fartlek, developed by the great Swedish coach by the same name. It usually is done off track in a wooded area, on a golf course, or any area that is inspiring and challenging to the runners. An easy way to understand Homer fartlek is to compare it to soccer. Homer fartlek, like soccer, involves changing speed, running hard for a period, followed by a period of slower activity for recovery before charging hard for another period. An athlete must be disciplined to perform Homer fartlek training as he alone determines how hard to run throughout the workout. The runner exerts as much energy as he wishes, performing as many pickups, surging at race pace, or running hills as desired. The only limits to Homer Fartlek are how far or how long to run. An experienced runner will take advantage of the workout, forcing himself to his limits of endurance, challenging himself to extend beyond previous limits. Because of the relative inexperience in pushing to the limits, a young runner should run a specific workout. For example, a good fartlek run for an inexperienced middle distance runner might be a 45-minute run that includes quarter-mile surges above race pace, short bursts over 100 yards at 90% effort, and possibly include a number of three-quarter-mile runs at race pace. Each surge at hard pace would be followed by a period of recovery at a slower pace. 45 minutes of fartlek running following this schedule supplies quality running above race pace, at race pace for a predetermined distance, and below race pace. Fartlek training is a part of the foundation of a good running program. To be a successful distance runner requires strength, endurance, an understanding of race pace, and a knowledge of race tactics. All these aspects can be achieved through fartlek training. Interval training is an important aspect in the running program at Oregon. Simply put, interval training means the rest period between running sessions is the measured portion of the training. If done properly, interval training develops cardiovascular conditioning in a runner more quickly than any other form of training. Interval training is a method of measuring progression in an athlete. As the athlete becomes stronger and better conditioned, the recovery period between repetitions becomes shorter and each run is performed at a faster pace. An added benefit of interval training is it helps the runner learn and master correct race pace. Interval running should only be started after first establishing a strong foundation of endurance through fartlek and long distance running. When first starting interval training, it is recommended the athlete recover for the same distance he runs during the interval. For example, the middle distance runner starting an interval program might perform six 400 meter runs with a 400 meter jog between each. Gradually, as the athlete grows stronger, he may increase the interval distance, decrease the resting interval, and quicken the pace. The runner should jog between intervals, keeping up his momentum throughout the workout. The number of intervals the athlete should run depends on the fitness level of the athlete, his competitive distance, and the goal of his training program. Generally, the longer the competitive distance, the longer the interval, though some short, fast interval work for developing speed is recommended for all distance runners. An additional benefit from running intervals is the athlete can see the progression he is making and thus gain confidence. 
Another important aspect to the running program at Oregon is what we call repetitions. Repetitions are very similar to interval training, except in repetition training, we are not concerned about the rest period. The runner will do certain sets of repetitions with the idea of hitting a certain time and taking as much rest as necessary to hit that time. We usually do repetitions for speed work. The concept of repetition training is for a high quality workout running specific distances for specific times. The emphasis of a repetition workout is on the speed of the athlete as well as running for a predetermined pace. Running a repetition workout can bring the athlete to a state of oxygen death. This state is followed by a complete rest period for the athlete to recover his strength before initiating another run. Repetitions vary in length according to the competitive distance the athlete will run and is another tool by which the coach can measure his athlete's progress. Over the past decade, running has achieved new heights in popularity. A runner such as Alberto Salazar can now achieve overnight stardom nationally and internationally by winning a prestigious road race or marathon. With the running popularity, it is more important than ever that coaches and runners alike understand the concepts of training. The principles of training outlined in this program can help you to achieve your full potential. As distance running, whether for road racing, on track races, or in cross country, the competitive distance runner has to possess the most efficient athletic form possible. Wasted motion in distance running means wasted running energy. Wasting energy on every stride of a long distance run means greatly reducing potential as a distance runner. Identifying the optimum efficiency in every aspect of technique and suggesting drills to develop technique is the objective of this program. Success in distance running is largely determined by one's inherent talent. However, training, technique work, including tactics, certainly plays its part in developing that talent. At our level of competition, we don't attempt to change drastically one's running form, but we do adapt our training program to their particular style of running. For example, Rudy Chapa, who has a ball of the foot, foot strike on the ground, is on a training program that's different than Alberto Salazar, who has a heel to the ball of the foot strike. Generally speaking, middle and long distance runners are physically lean of frame. However, a runner's potential cannot be judged on the basis of his body build alone. Vladimir Kutz, one of the greatest distance runners of all time, was a rather stocky man who started out to be a prize fighter. Efficient use of the head and trunk, arms, hips, and legs is necessary to become effective at distance running. The upper body must be relaxed in distance running. The head should stay in natural alignment with the upper body. The eyes are focused ahead. Any side-to-side -side movement of the head can be transmitted down through the trunk, causing unwanted rotational movement and wasted energy. The shoulders should be relaxed allowing the upper arm to swing freely, yet conservatively in the shoulder sockets. If the upper body and shoulders are held rigid, the tightness can cause pressure on blood vessels, inhibiting blood flow, which can result in fatigue in the shoulders and arms. We usually will not spend too much time in teaching a distance runner how to breathe. It is a natural function that one does normally. Occasionally, however, we will have a runner who has difficulty in breathing by either an uneven rhythm or too shallow of breathing. We will take this individual and teach him a three or four count rhythm of breathing depending upon the difficulty of the run. For instance, a runner may develop a consistent four in, four out breathing rhythm for a moderate pace steady run and have to change down through a three in, three out rhythm going up a gentle grade and down farther to a two-in, two-out rhythm for a sprint at the finish 
or for a steeper grade. The key to breathing is to develop a consistent pattern, one the body can become more comfortable with over a long workout and being able to control the rhythm according to the situation. Another aspect of breathing while running is to breathe through the nose and mouth. Some runners, especially but not exclusively women, attempt to keep their mouth closed when running. In doing this, the runner inhibits the amount of air he or she is capable of inhaling and loses efficient breathing action. Breathe through the nose and mouth, even if it means inhaling a bug or two along the way. When exhaling, it is recommended to blow the air out only through the mouth and to do so through pursed lips. Pursing the lips creates a better percentage of oxygen exchange in the lungs. In effect, breathing through pursed lips limits the airstream and makes more efficient use of each breath. Practice the technique of inhaling through the nose and mouth, breathing through a steady rhythm, and exhaling through pursed lips every time you run. Soon it will become second nature. Hip position for the distance runner is another vital concern. Runners should tilt the lower part of the hips forward while keeping the top of the pelvis back. This hip position can be demonstrated by lying on the ground and then flattening the small of the back against the ground. When this is done, the hips will be tilted forward into the correct position. This places the runner's center of gravity behind the pelvis area, allowing the runner greater range of movement in the striding motion. Also, with the hips in this position, the runner can eliminate wasted energy expended, pushing the body up and over the hips in each stride. Additionally, running tall with the hips in this position helps develop a smooth running style, eliminating much of the up and down bobbing motion. Because it is desirable to hold the hips rolled somewhat forward while running, strong abdominal muscles are required to hold the position. If the stomach muscles sag, the pelvis and hips will come out of the most efficient alignment. Drills to strengthen the abdominal muscles include sit-ups and back extensions. Additional drills include laying flat on the back and rolling back with the legs overhead to touch the small of the back on the floor, simultaneously lifting the knees. Developing an efficient stride is necessary to become an effective distance runner. The key to stride length is to develop the most economical stride possible. Every time the foot strikes the ground, the center of gravity is directly over the leg. Many runners tend to overstride, extending the leg too far in front of the body, creating an up and down movement of the upper body as it rotates around the fulcrum of the extended leg. Though knee drive is not as important in distance running as it is in sprinting and hurdling, leg extension behind the body is extremely important. If the runner does not get full extension of the leg behind the body, he is limiting the drive off the leg and hampering the efficiency of his stride. With the shortened stride, he must take more strides per race, tiring sooner and losing speed. An effective drill for developing leg extension of the driving leg behind the body is bounding stadium steps. This can also be done while wearing a weighted vest. Hill running can also be used to develop extension and power in the driving motion of the legs. Two styles of foot landings are common in distance running. The prominent style, landing on the heel and rolling forward along the outside of the foot to the ball of the foot, is performed by perhaps 80% of all distance runners. The other style, landing on the ball of the foot, is the style more associated with sprinters. It's less common and it puts more strain on the foreleg. People who run on the balls of their feet tend to develop more stress fractures, problems with the Achilles tendon, and other lower leg afflictions that result from not distributing the shock of footfalls over the full area of the foot. The runner who runs on the balls of his foot, however, probably has developed larger calf muscles and may be able to sprint better towards the end of the race. Another consideration of foot placement for distance runners is the choice of shoes. All running shoes are not created equal, just as all runners' feet are not the same. Good shoes should have a raised heel for supporting the Achilles tendon and eliminating lateral movement of the Achilles. They should also have some arch support, the height of which will vary according to the runner. A good shoe will also have a broadened heel for supporting the structure of the leg and a shock-absorbing sole of suitable quality to last through miles and miles of hard pounding. Most of the brand name manufacturers have developed a broad variety of suitable shoes for distance runners and most shoe stores have experienced personnel on staff to recommend types of shoes for training. 
It should be noted, however, to never wear racing flats in training as they do not offer the degree of protection that a well-built training shoe allows. The action of the arms for distance runners is different than that used by sprinters and hurdlers. The arm swings in rhythm with the legs, the forward driving arm compensating for the knee drive of the leg, yet the degree of movement is more limited. Rather than a high driving arm action with the elbow coming behind the body as in sprinting, distance runners should keep the arms lower, swinging in front of the body with a slight motion across the body. The hands are held fairly close together as if the runner could hold a short stick in both hands as he runs. By holding the arms fairly high and not dropping the hands below the waist, circulation is improved in the arms, helping to eliminate fatigue in the shoulders and arms. The hands should be carried thumbs up and at a 45 degree angle with the fingers lightly cupped. The key to arm action for distance runners is to develop a conservative, efficient rhythm, relaxing the upper body as much as possible. Arm action does change late in the race, however, when the runner becomes a sprinter. Then he will lower the arms, pump them faster, and reach behind the body with the elbow, creating more drive in the arms to develop greater leg speed. All else being equal in a distance race, it is often the employment of tactics and strategies that will determine who will be the winner. There are many concepts in strategies and tactics in distance running, but they all evolve around that you either want to take advantage of your strength or your speed. An example of a runner taking advantage of his strength would be the individual pushing the pace early in the race, making the pace hard. An example of one who is relying upon his speed is the individual sitting back in the race, always in contact, but perhaps never taking the lead until the final 165 where he attempts to use his speed to win the race. The choice of running style wholly depends on the runner's ability. Determining the strengths of a runner can be done early in his career by testing. From these tests, a program can be developed that will capitalize on his strengths, whether it be speed or pace awareness. The guiding philosophy for distance runners is to be aware of and use your strengths and try to cover your weaknesses. As the athlete grows older, he will naturally grow stronger and, with experience, be able to utilize his strong points developed through training to his best advantage. Tactics to practice and master, once the athlete has determined his strengths and weaknesses, include the following. Going out fast. This is particularly suited to mass road races, cross country, and to a certain extent, on track races. Going out fast means moving to the head of the pack and maintaining a fast pace until the rest of the field becomes strung out. In a road race, going out fast may mean running above the desirable pace per mile for over a mile, pulling away from the crowd, allowing yourself some free running room. In a shorter race, for example, a mile or 800 meter race on the track, going out fast means putting yourself into an optimum position with the leaders toward the front of the pack and not letting yourself get boxed in. Varying the pace is a tactic that should only be tried by experienced runners who have calloused themselves to the technique and training. Varying the pace in a race often means throwing in a 58-second quarter mile in the middle of a 5,000-meter race or sprinting hard up and down a hill in a cross-country race. Varying the pace, bursting away from the pack for a short period of time, is an effective weapon late in the race. Psychologically, the competition may not be able to cope with the sprint, and a well-conditioned runner can put distance between himself and the pack. An effective way to prevent a runner from attempting to vary the pace is for a strong runner whose strength is his ability to carry a race pace over a long period of time to run faster than normal for several laps, eliminating the chance for the competition to throw in one or two fast laps. Training for a varied race pace is mandatory for success in competition. A variety of drills can be used for developing this tactic. One drill, called the 40-30 drill, involves a runner running a number of laps alternating between fast and slow 220s. He should attempt to run the fast ones no slower than 30 seconds, followed by a recovery 220 no slower than 40 seconds. Obviously, these times should be adapted to the particular age and ability group you are working with. This drill helps build up the endurance of a runner and will help him be able to push a hard pace over and over in a race. 
This drill is also useful in training a distance runner for the indoor competitive season where the track is shorter with tight corners and longer and faster straights. Another drill effective for learning varied paces is to run approximately two miles alternating sprinting for 55 yards then jogging for 55 yards. The runner is barely able to get slowed down from the 55 yard sprint before it's time to go off on another one. Again, this drill strengthens endurance and speed, the two concepts involved in varying the pace in a distance race. Another tactic to be considered and practiced by distance runners is the strategy used at the finish of a race. At the end of a race, every distance runner becomes a sprinter, raising his knees to get better stride length and lowering the arms and pumping them faster to increase his leg speed. The distance runner is not concerned anymore about conserving energy, Rather, he attempts to use all his remaining energy in a sprint to the finish. This buildup may start anywhere from a half mile to 200 yards from the finish, depending on the individual strengths of the runner and on the strategy employed by other runners. A number of running drills can be performed to prepare the runner for using this particular tactic at the finish of the race. Called finishing drills, these drills can be tailored to fit the strategy of any runner depending on his race. Here are some examples of finishing drills. The first, called sprint float sprint, is run over 165 yards. In it, the runner sprints over 55 yards, then relaxes but runs at the same pace over the next 55 yards, and then sprints again over the final 55 yards. Next is the 330 buildup. Here, the runner covers 110 yards in 15 seconds, then he covers 110 yards in 14 seconds, then he covers his last 110 yards in 12 seconds. The same type of progression can be done over 660 yards with the runner covering the first 220 in 30 seconds, the second in 28 seconds, and the last in 26 seconds. A similar finishing drill is cut down 330s. Here the runner begins by covering 330 yards in the 50 second range and ends by covering the same distance in the 40s. In cross country, road racing and marathons, hills may be involved. One needs to know how to properly use the hill to his advantage as it can mean the difference between winning and losing. Not only should you know how to run up the hill, but you need to know how to take advantage of the downhill section for many runners attempt to rest. When running up a hill, the runner should lean forward, bringing the center of gravity under the body rather than trailing it behind. If the runner attempts to stand upright, the center of gravity will fall behind the hips, creating the same over the hump situation discussed earlier. By leaning forward into the hill, the hips are brought into a more efficient position. At the same time, the arms are lowered, becoming more aligned into the sprinting position and pumped faster to pick up leg speed. The stride length is shortened, the runner taking smaller steps but moving the legs faster. Breathing rhythm will change too, possibly stepping up the rhythm one or two beats faster than when on even ground. As the athlete clears the top of the hill, his stride should lengthen, arms should relax, and his breathing will become more normal. The downhill has traditionally been the place where many distance runners rest, regaining their strength after expending themselves by charging up the hill. But this is also a place where the experienced runner can make up much time on his competition or increase his advantage on the rest of the field. By running downhill rather than coasting or resting, the athlete will cover the course much faster than others with a fairly small exertion of energy. If it is a steep hill, the athlete will need to lean back a bit, but on most hills he should try to stay over the hips as on a flat, allowing him to stride out going down the hill. Gravity plays a large role in learning to run downhill properly. You don't want to fight gravity or break against it downhill as is experienced when the runner leans back, landing heels first, and flapping the arms to maintain balance. To work with gravity in running downhill, the athlete must attempt to get his body as nearly perpendicular to the running surface as possible, with the upper body weight over the hips and the hips over the heels. In contrast to running uphill, the arms will be brought close to the chest. Rather than pumping fast, they should be brought into a rhythm with the legs and help control the running form and speed. Effective downhill running takes practice, and it's not something that can be developed over a short period of time. Start on a gentle slope, preferably grass-covered, 
and work at bringing the weight forward so the center of gravity does not trail the body. Gradually increase your stride length and leg speed until eventually you are running with the hill, using your body weight and gravity to put distance between yourself and the field. The key to distance technique is to optimize the efficiency of all the body parts involved in running. Energy exerted to swing the arms, move the head, or to push the trunk up and over the fulcrum of the hip is wasted energy, energy that could be put to better use in running more efficiently. If an athlete understands the principles and tactics involved in distance running technique, he can apply them to his particular situation and style and improve as a distance runner.